Jesus' teachings of nonviolent love of friends and enemies, gospel nonviolence, is ultimately rooted in the divinity. Jesus is not a philosopher. I mean, George Bush way back said Jesus was his favorite philosopher. Jesus is not a philosopher. A philosopher is someone that looks at reality and puts together some theory of how reality works, how people should live, uh, etc. Jesus is not a philosopher. Jesus is the revealer of the will of God, or he's nothing. He's the self-revelation of God. He is the definitive revelation of God, of God's will, of God's way. Hmm? And so, in that sense, huh, in, in, in that sense, when he speaks, that, when he says that we are to love our enemies, when he teaches that the rejection of violence and enmity, it's not like Gandhi said it, or Dorothy Day said it, or a human, mere human being is saying this. This is God in the flesh saying it. This is God saying what God desires. And therefore, there's something about the fact that if we alter the teaching of Jesus, if we're not truthful about what he said, indeed, if we even make believe that he said the opposite of what he said, we're doing something terrible. We're doing something far more than simply lying one person to another. We're taking the will of God and we are substituting our will for God's will. That's right. The bishop, the priest, the minister, who says that Jesus taught a way that includes violence and enmity, war, capital punishment, abortion, whatever the case may be. That Jesus taught a way that includes, that includes an ethic of hate. It's, telling, it's, it's not telling the truth, but he or she is not telling the truth about what God wills, about what God wants. And this is on a level of seriousness that's far more intense, with greater consequences than simply saying, go east if you want to go to America from England. Why I am raising this is, is because Christian nonviolence, gospel nonviolence, the nonviolent love of friends and enemies is rooted in the being, the nature of God. It is the truth of God, and hence is the truth about all that God created. One of the basic questions that we're confronted with as human beings, all human beings at all times, in all places, in all cultures, is the fundamental question of religious consciousness. What kind of God is God if God exists? And what does God expect of us, if anything? Every religion in the history of the world tries to answer that. Well, Jesus does too. He has to respond to it. And Jesus says, God is love. God is father, mother, parent that infinitely loves those that he created. And what does God expect? He expects that those who created, those who he created, will love those he created as he does. He expects those who he created to imitate his love 
because he gave them the capacity to do that. They don't have to follow it. It has to be free if it's to be like his, because his love is a free love. But the capacity is there to love as God loves. And we say, wow, we look at Jesus. If Jesus is who all the churches teach he is, the Messiah, the Christ, the Son, the living God, then the imitation of Christ is the imitation of God. And the imitation of other than Christ is the imitation of what is not of God. Because Jesus is the definitive presentation of God in time, in space, and in history. And so, we be, we, we're grateful to God. We're grateful to God. That he came up, that, that he, first of all, he gave us the capacity to know him, to know his will. And then that he came among us in Jesus to show us what that will was, what he was, what he is and what he expects of us. And not only that, we're grateful to him because he tells us this is what he is. This is what the universe is. This is what you are. He comes here to tell us how to achieve the fullness of human life. The fullness of human life forever. By entering into his life, which is his way, which is his will. I do think it's important to recognize that Jesus comes to give us the fullness of life, not to take anything away, not to harm us, not to hurt us, but it is the fullness of life so that we can become fully human by loving as he loves, by living in the life of God, by loving as he loves. I suppose what's also equally important is to recognize that he comes to make us fully human. Not fully Greek or fully Irish or fully Jew or fully American. Fully human. It's quite clear that the nationalities and the tribes do not follow Jesus' way of nonviolent love and friend, of friends and enemies. And therefore, to be fully Irish, to be fully American, to be fully Russian, to be fully human, is, is not to be fully human. It's to be partisan. It's not to be Catholic. It's to be parochial. It's not to be universal. It is to follow a human-created way of dealing with life, imitating George Washington or Cromwell or God knows who else. Fully human is only achieved with all its consequences and all the good that can come from it is only achieved for one and all by the imitation of Christ. Loving is Christ's love. The nonviolent love of friends and enemies. Even unto death. 